welcome to the ophthalmic dispensing and audiology open evening we'll just give everyone a minute or so just to join and then we'll make a start Okay, so thank you for joining us tonight and taking the time out. Um, this evening, we wanted to provide some information about our ophthalmic dispensing and audiology courses, just to give an insight into how our courses are delivered and why we believe that ARU can support you and your students' professional journey to registration. If you have any questions throughout the, any of the presentations, there is a Q&A chat button at the top of the screen. So please pop any questions in there. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll come back to the questions and hopefully answer as many as we can. Okay, so just to introduce myself, my name is Shvana Yunus and I'm a course leader and have been at ARU for about three years now. Um, I have worked in practice as a contact lens optician for oh, coming up to probably just over 20 years and my experience has mainly been in large multiple high street practices um, and I do still work in practice as well just to ensure that my skills are current and this allows me to use real world scenarios to shape my teaching. Okay, so if we can move on to the next slide then please. Right, okay, so just to give you a little bit of information about ARU itself, um, so we are based in the city centre with a great public transport network link. Um, around the campus, we have several popular hotels which are within walking distance, um, and the train station is about a 15 to 20 minute walk as well, so not too far. Next slide, then, please. And Cambridge itself, so whereabouts is Cambridge? And what you can see here that it is not too far from King's Cross, Peterborough or Leicester. Uh, we have London Stansted and London Luton Airport as well, which is quite easily accessible. Um, and we do have some students currently that are on our courses that travel in from Ireland and Scotland. Um, and by road, you can see here that Birmingham and Norwich are also easily accessible as well. Next slide, please. Now, ARU itself, so the Climate Dispensing course has been running for over 30 years and audiology for over 10 years. We have a great mix of academic staff, including PhD level academics and also lecturer practitioners that are still working in practice as well. 
Um, each student is assigned a personal development tutor um, and that helps the student to adjust to being an ARU student and becomes an independent learner. Um, they also provide advice on academic progress and development, which we think is essential as a student who is on a blended learning course. Um, our students have access to libraries um, where you can borrow up to five items at one time on our blended learning courses. And you also have access to digital ebooks and study skills support, which includes maths, academic practice and referencing as well. We have subject specialist librarians and students can use our SCONOR scheme, which is where they can borrow or use books and journals at other libraries which are close to them as well, which is also very important for the blended learning students who are not on campus full time. Next slide then, please. So why ARU? Um, well, we have been awarded the Times Higher Education University of the Year. Um, this is the biggest prize in UK higher education, and this is due to us delivering high impact projects despite the challenges of COVID-19. Um, the award of University of the Year that recognises the positive difference that we make to the lives of our students and those in communities where we are based. We have also hosted the most sustainable British Science Festival in Chelmsford, which is a science festival that connects people with scientists, engineers and technologists. And we were also the first university to offer online and digital support services and open the first Samaritans University Hub in the UK. Next slide then, please. We have recently been awarded the Gold Teaching Excellence Framework test status. So this indicates that ARU has been consistently delivering high quality teaching, providing excellent student support and achieving student outcomes. So this is something that we are very, very proud of. And this has recently just been awarded to us. Next slide then, please. So our social media platforms provide further information about ARU. So if you don't already follow us, then please do so. Um, and then you can provide you with some more information. OK, so now we will hear from our subject specialist who will present the course structures in more detail. So I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Simon Rogersingham. Uh, thank you, Shabana. Um, so I'm just going to be talking through the foundation degree in, in hearing aid audiology. Um, uh, and the apprenticeship and, and the non-apprenticeship versions. But my colleague Mark will be joining a little bit later to actually just talk about apprenticeships more specifically um, because his knowledge on this is much better than mine. Um, so next slide, please. Thank you. So um, all of the courses that we actually provide in audiology at ARU are work based learning courses. So we really do think that this is a really good way um, to provide sustainable workforce developments. Um, for those of you who are attending who come from an audiology background, you know that we have a workforce crisis at the moment. People are really struggling to recruit and they're struggling to recruit in specific regional areas. So by um, being by hiring your own employees and training them up, you really ensure that not only are they um, appropriately skilled for your workplace context and your business or your clinic, but they're also um, uh, able to contribute while they're learning and they're much more likely to stay. Um, so, so this is a, a really nice approach. So you can start with us with a hearing care certificate, which is um, a distance learning undergraduate course, a nine month course, and that can get your um, hearing care assistant doing things like basic audiograms, um, uh, supporting with repairs, um, doing impressions, um, otoscopy. So really supporting uh, a hearing aid dispenser or an audiologist in that role. Um, and they can then move on to the foundation degree in hearing aid audiology, which is either the apprenticeship or the non-apprenticeship. And just to clarify, you don't need to do the hearing care certificate first. So um, you absolutely can go straight into that. 
some people do find it useful if you have someone who's not sure just to start with a hearing care certificate it's it's a lower stakes investment it's less intense and at that stage if they get through it and they realize that they actually don't want to do anything further you haven't lost anything you've still got someone who can support you um, clinically um, and administratively uh, but equally, if they if they do very well on it and they enjoy it, you know they're a really good candidate. Um, but of course, we can take people directly onto the foundation degree, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on my conversation today. There's also um, the option of the BSc Audiology top up degree, um, which is a blended learning course again for students in employment. And of course, if they want to go ahead and do um, a hearing research, um, MPhil and PhD, there's absolutely nothing stopping them. Um, so we do have students entering at different stages in the pathway um, and exiting at different stages. And that's something we really think is, is really valuable because it ensures people are getting appropriate training and qualifications as and when they need it. Next slide, please. Um, so the apprenticeship or, and the foundation degree. So generally, um, uh, the reason we still run a foundation degree and not just a degree apprenticeship is we know that sometimes colleagues, for example, from Northern Ireland will want to send students over here and can't access the apprenticeship. So we offer it in both ways, but it is essentially in many ways the same course. So it's a two year blended learning course. Um, you've got residentials, which is approximately total to 45 days. Some of them are done online, so they can be done remotely, uh, but we also have campus residential, usually blocks. So blocks of three or four days in a week. Um, and once students complete the course, they can register with the HCPC as a registered hearing aid dispenser. Um, so this is uh, a proper, proper qualification. Next slide, please. Uh, so that's just an example of us with some of our lovely graduates. Um, so you can see uh, my colleagues there. So there's Rob McKinnon in the corner in the red gown, um, who is one of our deputy heads of school along with me. Um, I'm right there at the back, also in a red gown, different university, but cool gown. Um, and then there are uh, Sri and Eldre, who are some of our course leaders. Um, and um, also some of our associate lecturers in practice. So there's Bavisha and Naomi. So we, we really utilize um, uh, clinical teaching, clinical teaching from people in practice. Um, and we're a lovely team. But I always like to put that photo up on them because it's quite nice to see what you end up with at the end. Um, it's a nice feeling. Next slide, please. So um, the aim of our programs are to train hearing care professionals who provide person centred and evidence based care. So it's not about training for one specific sector or environment. We, we want to train professionals that can work in any sector in any context. They're committed to continuing professional development and able to adapt across um, the changing sectors and patient and client populations. And this is particularly relevant because the face of audiology today is changing. We're seeing changes in demographics of our patient patients, increases in scope of practice. So this is particularly relevant. Next slide, please. So um, as mentioned before, um, this foundation degree means that students qualify with both a registrable qualification with HCPC, but they also do need to meet the standards um, of the university um, and so this provides a kind of nationally recognized qualification that they can then go on and use in terms of further training um, and this earn while you learn approach is usually really really appealing um, and it's really great to hire and recruit some promising candidates and develop them in this way but supervisors have a really, really important role. So we do expect supervisors or mentors, as they're called from in apprenticeship language, um, to support and guide um, their apprentices and students to develop them effectively. And you've seen our teaching team. We're a small team, concentrated staff. We communicate really frequently and we're always there to help. Next slide, please. Um, so a really key aspect of our learning is the highly kind of involved and interactive learning. So students attend residentials on campus and they use that to really reinforce their, their learning in clinic. So we want them to be active in clinic really as much as possible from day one to get the most out of the experience. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of uh, 
how learning normally takes place. So students will have online self-paced learning, they'll have a weekly guide, they'll have remote module tutor support and recorded video lectures. They'll also have workplace learning, which is where you'll be supporting a lot. So that's around practice and observation of procedures, the logbook and portfolio. And then they'll have residentials both online and face-to-face. -face. So face-to-face -face is really focused on tackling complex theory and refining clinical skills. And online sessions will be really focused seminars and supportive tasks and preparation for that on campus teaching. So we normally have an online residential before they come on campus really to ensure that they're getting the most out of their time on campus. Next slide please. So uh, in terms of how the course is structured, so it's structured over two academic years um, and over the First year, they really focus on developing their primary theoretical knowledge in the first trimester, along with skills such as otoscopy and case history taking. In the second trimester, um, they focus on skills such as pure tone audiometry, impressions and first fit. And that means that from trimester three onwards, they're really able to do those initial skills under indirect supervision. OK, um, so when you feel that you're ready, they can start contributing to clinical tasks in that way, and that's incredibly useful in building their knowledge and experience, but also ensuring that they're contributing towards the workplace in a meaningful way. And the final two trimesters of the course um, are really focused on um, uh, oral rehabilitation, hearing aid technologies in more detail, uh, more detail on uh, specialised professional practice and audiological assessment. And so with this, they'll be doing tympanometry, speech testing, learning to integrate results. Now for apprentices, they'll also have a clinical audiology practice module, which captures all of the apprenticeship specific components and will focus a lot more on your local clinical um, approaches. So things like uh, payment plans or repair policies, and that's that's really useful practical learning for them. And they will also do um, the ear care and wax removal component. Uh, they'll also be recording a logbook throughout their study. So this logbook just helps them evidence their clinical practice. It also provides opportunities for you to give them feedback and supervision and ensure they're meeting the standards that you need them to be at for when they reach their, their gateway or endpoint assessment for apprentices um, or just graduation for non-apprenticeships. Uh, next slide please and this is my final slide so if you're getting bored and you're not really interested in ears at all don't worry we're nearly done um so in terms of what our expectations are from the mentor or the employer um or the supervisor so we this degree absolutely requires students to learn on the job it requires them to relate the taught programme to their role within your organisation. And so we do need to look at, we do need you to support them in the workplace throughout the duration of their studies, explore opportunities for the apprentice to gain the knowledge, skills and behaviours so they can evidence the standard for apprentices, apprentices but it's really the same for non-apprentices, and also to help identify their goals and establish a sense of direction. What are they going to do after qualification? Where are they going to take it? What might their area of specialism be? Or what might be their role within the organisation? These kinds of things. Provide review and feedback. And um, for those who are apprentices, we'll have formal progress review meetings um, and uh, with as an institution. So with ARU, our study coaches here at ARU and the apprentices. And this has been so useful. So it's really useful in actually identifying any areas of development, um, any needs for support for the apprentices and make sure, uh, making sure everyone's on the same page. Um, and you also need to sign off their activities, so make sure that you know what they're submitting for their e-portfolio and their logbook, um, and just in general ensure they're progressing well. This None of this will come as a massive surprise to any of you because these are all things that we would normally consider part of clinical supervision, um, but they're also really good ways of ensuring that you retain your graduate uh, employees after they complete their programme and they're able to progress well and engage well within the organisation. So uh, that's it from me now. Um, I will hand over to Rachel Avery, who is 
uh, one of the course leaders for the uh, dispense, Dispensing Optician Award um, and we'll be able to talk a little bit more about that. But if you do have any questions for me, the best thing to do is to pop them in the chat and I can answer them there or pick them up at the end. Thank you very much, Simon. So um, my name is Rachel. I'm a dispensing optician and I'm currently the course leader for the BSc course in ophthalmic dispensing. Next slide, please. OK, so um, what are the main benefits of coming to ARU to study ophthalmic dispensing? So first of all, our BSc course is designed to be blended learning. So again, it's very much earn whilst you learn. So um, students will be in practice about four days a week or five days a week um, and they will study uh, at the same time. So if you've got staff that are looking for a next step, looking for a development, then this is a fantastic way um, of providing them um, a course where you don't have to lose your staff, you don't have to lose your workforce, you can provide them that training and upskill your staff while you still retain them within your practice. So one of the main benefits of coming to ARU is that we take care of the whole process right through to registration with the GOC. So you can apply on our website um, and we can assess the, the entry requirements. I'll talk about the entry requirements a little bit later. Uh, so we can accept you onto the course um, direct through our website and through our internal team. And then we will um, take you through that course. And then at the end of the three years, once you've completed the course, we can apply for registration for you directly from in-house. So real main benefits are that we don't have any other external accreditation process there's no hidden costs we're very transparent about the costs so there will be a yearly fee which will um, include all the tuition it will include two attempts at any assessments and it will also include access to our very comprehensive library. So all of the texts and all of the resources that are required in order to study on this course will be made available without any additional costs, which I think is a fantastic benefit um, to your students. Next slide, please. OK. So um, thinking about how we teach here at ARU, we do provide a, a variety of different teaching techniques. One of the great things is that we have really small cohort sizes. So we take a maximum of 36 students per year, which gives a really nice high student to staff ratio and it allows our students to form really close bonds and um, throughout those three years of study. Um, within our profession, we do a lot of peer reviews, we do a lot of discussions and we really lean on each other to learn um, from each other from working in different environments. So having a really small cohort really promotes um, people to feel comfortable enough to share their experiences and gives a really nice rich experience. We will uh, deliver the majority of our teaching online. So over a 24 week period, we will teach um, we will provide online content on a weekly basis and we will invite students to come in and spend a week with us four times per year. So there will be four individual weeks where students will come to Cambridge um, and they'll spend a week with us and we will provide a variety of different teaching whilst they're here. So um, we will provide external speakers from different um, organisations to come in and give a bit of a, a variety of different experiences. We will provide traditional style, styles of lectures. We have a lot of discussions and debates and peer reviews whilst um, students come on residentials because those are the kind of things that are a little bit more difficult to do um, with online teaching. Now, to provide a really varied experience, we will take students um, to different environments to allow them a chance to experience different um, the profession from different angles. So in the second year, for example, we will um, get a bus and take all of our students down to Rodenstock, which is an ophthalmic lens manufacturer. Um, we'll spend a day there working in the manufacturing plant. So we'll, um, our students will have a chance to do things like hand edging of spectacle lenses um, and have a real look round, look at the tinting process, look how coating happens. And I think that gives a really good understanding. So when, when talking to patients, if you've actually been into these environments and see how these things work, it allows you to give um, a really good patient experience. 
We'll also find um, half day placements for our students again so we can place students in different environments and it gives a really enhanced view and a really good understanding of how actually really comprehensive eye care is delivered not by just one person but by a team of different people with different areas of expertise. We have really great facilities here at ARU. We've just recently moved building and invested a lot of money into our facilities. So we've got very comprehensive teaching labs available. We've got state of the art equipment and um, it's all brand new. So it's a really great time to um, send students to ARU. Everything's brand new. Everything's fresh um, and it's and it's really lovely space to work in. Now, during your course, during your students time here, we understand that getting feedback is really important to learning and developing. So we will be providing lots of opportunity for feedback, both from from teaching staff in the moment, or it could be um, written feedback. Or again, we're going to encourage a lot of peer discussions so students can get feedback um, from different areas. Next slide, please. So just as a brief overview of the course um, to let you know what we're going to be doing um, in the first year, we think a lot about self reflection. So one thing that's really important to us is that we align it um, as much with real life as we possibly can. So um, as a professional, as a healthcare professional, it's really important that we are quite good at self reflection about identifying uh, learning needs for ourselves, about identifying things that we're good at as well and celebrating those. So, throughout the first year, we're going to encourage a lot of self reflection, a lot of thoughts about personal development, um, and we're going to help learn how to write a personal development plan. Which, when you register with the GOC, that's the first thing they ask you to do uh, once every three years is write a personal development plan. So, we should. Um, be equipping the students with the skills to be able to write those things um, straight away. We'll cover things like evidence based practice, so we'll give students the background in how to go and find information and communicate that clearly to a patient um, so the patients again get a nice um, good experience with comprehensive information delivered to them in a way that they can understand. And then lastly, we will concentrate again on building rapport with patients. So patients have a really nice time when they come to our practices. We understand that it encourages trust. We understand that it encourages loyalty for patients. So rapport is something that we're quite keen um, to instill right at the start as well. Moving into the second year, we take a bit more of a clinical approach. Um, a lot more of our residential sessions will be in the lab. They'll be led by optometrists and we'll introduce students to some of the tools uh, and the equipment designed for assessment of vision. Um, so that will again provide a really varied experience. Um, and as well in ophthalmic lenses too, one of our assessments is that we will ask students to um, act as a, a CPD provider and learn how to write a comprehensive um, application to provide a CPD event, which again, we think aligns with real world experience. It hopefully means that your students will be able to either assist you in writing provider led sessions or potentially becoming a provider when they qualify. Next slide, please. And then in the third year, we're taking a little bit more of a business and marketing approach. We're going to uh, have a project which is a team based project where we write a business plan for a new business. We're going to think about how to market that business, how to um, build a business from scratch, thinking about all the finance things. Um, the laws as far as how you need to run a practice and stay above the law, all the places that you need to register yourself with. So again, nice comprehensive view um, of the world of work and again, some business skills at the same time. And of course, at the end of the third year, we will be asking all the students to take uh, what we call the OSCE. So that's some practical based exams, lots of different skills that we will ask um, students to demonstrate practically for us in order to gain uh, professional registration with the GOC. Next slide, please. Another thing that I think is really fantastic about ARU is that we have um, extra courses available which draw upon the skill sets that other departments might have. So um, thinking about dispensing in general, so we offer these ARU CPD modules which are free of charge modules. 
they don't count towards the degree classification, but they really give some extra skills on top. So we have courses at the moment in organisation. We have courses in different types of technology. We have courses in social media marketing. So all of these, I feel, are skills that a dispensing optician could really use in practice and could really make businesses more rich with these extra skills that they can gain whilst they're here at ARU. Next slide, please. So just a, a little bit more of an introduction uh, to me, the course leader. My name's Rachel. I'll be the course leader um, of the BSc in dispen dispensing optician in ophthalmic dispensing. Um, my background for about the last 20 years, I've worked in independent practice. So um, between the, the different members of the team, we have some very variety in our backgrounds. So um, my hopes for the new course is that we can equip students to feel comfortable in dispensing things like free form single vision lenses, in thinking about how we can get um, the best possible outcomes for our patients using a variety of of different products available. Next slide please. And just to quickly introduce you to the rest of the team, I think uh, we'll, again a real strong point of ARU is we have such variety in our team. So our dispensing team um, will be involved at various points throughout the course. We have um, doctors, we have low vision experts, we have contact lens opticians, we have dispensing opticians, we have optometrists in our team so we can provide a real varied um, approach and different perspectives and that the thought of being part of a multidisciplinary team we really can provide those different perspectives for you. Next slide please. So I mentioned earlier that you can apply um, for the BSc Dispensing Optician course at, via our website, so we don't need to go through UCAS. Now, our entry requirements at the moment are five GCSEs. Your students need to have achieved grade four, or that would be the equivalent of a C or above. And we ask for those grades to include English language, maths, and at least one science subject. This course um, is fairly maths heavy at the beginning, so it is um, useful for students to be quite proficient in maths. We do, as Shabana mentioned, have extra um, support with um, certain skills like organisation, like maths, like writing, academic writing. So we can support students who may not feel um, that maths is their strong point. But yes, we ask for a C or above at GCSE. We would also ask for our students to have a DBS check, and that's because we do work with general public and we will be required to work with children uh, throughout the course under supervision. And the last thing is that it's an absolute must, um, an essential requirement of the course is that all of our students will be registered with the GOC as a student trainee dispensing optician. So that's incredibly important. Without that registration with the GOC, we can't offer um, to do assessments. So it's really important. Um, it is part of the application process and we will be uh, mentioning that several times um, throughout the application process and through the welcome week as well. So it's absolutely essential that students uh, will all be registered with the General Optical Council throughout the duration of study. If you have a student that's interested in joining the course and they may not have GCSEs, um, then we are able to accept people um, through interview if they have relevant experience and can demonstrate some skills um, that would be required to enter the course. So that it is possible to request an interview uh, and gain entry without those um, entry requirements. So that's all from me. Thank you for listening. I'm going to hand over now to Mark, who is an expert in degree apprenticeships and can tell you a little bit more about how those things work. Thanks ever so much, Rachel. Um, I dread being called an expert about anything, but <laughs> appreciate it. Yeah, I am indeed Mark Rotherer, um, strategic lead for degree apprenticeships in the Degrees at Work team here at Anglia Ruskin University. And I am not an optical dispenser, an optician, a hearing aid dispenser, anything like that. My expertise lies in the field of apprenticeships. So, um, I'm going to run through a couple of quick slides. There's a little bit of crossover between the things that I talk about and some of the things that Simon touched on. I'm going to try and focus on the things that I know more about. Um, you can go next slide again, please. 
and in fact we can just we'll show the next slide just so you get a bit of a sense because it just sets the scene of where we are in terms of as a university in terms of work-based learning but if I could get the next slide I'll, I'll dive straight into the content um, about apprenticeships so <clears throat> as has been mentioned like a lot of these courses are work-based anyway um, so the apprenticeship is not radically different from what you've heard already in terms of the way that it's delivered but it is funded differently um, and it does tend to work to slightly different outcomes um, because as you can see here um, it's it's based on an employer driven trailblazer so all apprenticeships are necessarily grounded in an industry defined standard um, created by what they call a trailblazer group uh, my favourite word for a committee because it sounds so dynamic and exciting, but um, there it is. What they lack in speed, they often make up for in quality. Um, so what the Trailblazer does is it brings together a group of um, industry experts, normally a number of blue chip companies, a couple of small employers, a couple of education providers, and they identify where there are skills shortages. Um, so in this instance, maybe uh, hearing aid dispensers, op optical dispensers, the, the, the like. They'll bring together the employers from those sectors and they'll say, OK, well, how would you recognise uh, a qualified optical dispenser or hearing aid dispenser according to the knowledge, skills and behaviours that that person was able to evidence? And you can see on the slide there, it says a job with a company in qualification to achieve KSBs. KSBs is a shorthand acronym for knowledge, skills and behaviours. So that trailblazer group, everyone on it essentially gets their job descriptions out and says, well, this is what we think a hearing aid dispenser looks like and this is what we think a hearing aid dispenser looks like and can do and how they would perform in the workplace. Um, and out of that negotiation comes an apprenticeship standard, an industry defined apprenticeship standard. So we can very clearly say that we know that if we can train someone to develop on evidence a set of knowledge skills and behaviors they will be occupationally competent in the role uh, that they've been trained to do um, so an apprenticeship is training for a role a specified role and it's the development of knowledge skills and behaviors in the in the apprentice that make them occupationally competent in that role just to pick out a couple of the other points on this slide there are three stakeholders in every apprenticeship there's an employer an apprentice and a provider ARU would be the provider, you would be the employer um, and your apprentice could be essentially anyone. There's no age limit on apprenticeships. Um, there are actually, with a few exceptions, very little um, limitation in terms of qualifications. We're not allowed to train anyone in any knowledge, skill or behaviour that they're already demonstrably fully competent at and can evidence it. So um, we can't probably put someone on an apprenticeship who's already done hearing aid dispenser higher apprenticeship or a higher degree um, but we could put someone on it who had a first degree in philosophy or history or something like that perhaps because their knowledge skills and behaviors that they have from that don't particularly cross over with those required for um, a hearing aid dispenser um, apprentices will receive off the job training time so this is one of the commitments that you make as an employer to support your apprentices is that you're obliged to give them um, a minimum amount of training time. We have to write a course that achieves at least six and a half hours a week across the duration of the program. Um, you might find that actually the, the requirement is slightly higher than that overall, but broadly it, it weighs down to being around about 47 days a year that they need to commit to their studies. I think it's important to remember that an apprenticeship is a, is a degree or a foundation degree that you do through work, not alongside work. So um, whilst there is that time that they have to commit to their studies, these are all work based courses and so they're learning on the job. And the more accurately you mentor and support your apprentices, the more likely it is that the work that they're doing to complete their academic qualification goes hand in hand with the work that they're doing to deliver positive outcomes for your organization so as you can see the slide the, the bullet there says combines academic knowledge and workplace experience for job job specific skills I'll pick up on one last point from this slide, which is about the way that apprenticeships are funded. They're incredibly generously supported. So um, there are two ways, two primary ways that apprenticeships are paid for by the employer. So apprentices don't pay for apprenticeships. Employers pay for apprenticeships. If as an employer you have a wage bill in excess of three million pounds a year, you'll pay the apprenticeship levy. 
0.5% of the value of your wage bill in excess of £3 million. Um, and that money goes to the Exchequer, gets turned into a digital voucher and handed back into your apprenticeship account and you can use it to pay for apprenticeships. So if you are a large employer, then apprenticeships are essentially paid for via a tax rebate, at least the cost of the course. If you're a small employer, then that means your wage bill is below three million pounds a year. You're eligible for what's called co-investment, which basically means there's a 95 percent subsidy for the cost of the course. So you would pay five percent in real money um, and the other 95 percent we would draw down on your behalf from the Education Skills Funding Agency. And indeed, for most areas, um, we can access a levy transfer from a large employer. Many large employers don't spend all of their levy and they're able to pass their levy on to other employers. So even if 5% felt a bit expensive for you, we can probably get that fee waived by, by introducing you to one of the levy transfer pots that are available. So a bit, bit of a broad overview there. If I could get the next slide, please, which really covers a lot of the same material, but in a slightly different format. So if you're more of a, a reading and writing person than a visual person this might this might strike you a bit more easily but um this lays out very much the same stuff so i've covered the, the three stakeholders the fact that apprenticeships are, are governed by apprenticeship standards and that those are funded by the education skills funding agency and overseen by the institute for apprenticeships and technical education or ifate as we like to know them that apprenticeships balance their um, working time with their studying time, but that those things should be integrated and that there are three uh, parties in an apprenticeship. Um, if I could take the next slide, please. I think. Yeah, this just covers a little bit um, about how the course, particularly the hearing aid dispensing program works and starts to pick up on the idea that as I've noted, the apprenticeships are generously funded in terms of the cost of the course. So really the thing that you need to be thinking about as an employer, um, the expense, if you will, of an apprenticeship is in the support that you need to give to your apprentices whilst they're on programme. So they need to they need to have that time to commit to their off the job training. You need to provide them with a mentor from the outset. And Sima touched on some of the details of, of how mentoring works. But from where I'm sitting, our most successful apprentices are the ones that have the most successful mentoring relationships. For me, it's where you extract the value from the time that you're you're giving them to commit to their studies. The closer they're integrated with the mentor and the closer then that you can help them build the bridge between the academic content in their course and the uh, practice that they're committing in your business, the more value that you will get out of it, the better the apprentice, the apprentice's outcomes will be um, academically, but also professionally. So getting clear about the mentor, getting them in from the from the outset, making sure that they're actively involved in the progress review and in the process of connecting academic with practical learning in the workplace. It's absolutely crucial um, to a successful apprenticeship experience. I think I'm going to gloss over the next two slides. If I could just take the next slide. I think these just, just give you a quick view of the modules and the content of the course. Um, so that you can just take a little look. Um, it is it is essentially, I know it's a foundation degree, but it is a degree apprenticeship. The clue's hiding in plain sight. It's a degree and an apprenticeship. So there are modules that make up the academic qualification. And then there's the process of recording the knowledge, skills and behaviours that make up the apprenticeship. If I take the next slide as well, please, that'll just cover year two. And the next slide. This just covers off the entry requirements. So for this program, as you see, we're looking for around about 32 UCAS tariff points. It is absolutely crucial for apprenticeship programs that the level two literacy and numeracy qualifications are in place. Um, we can, we do have some flexibility around it, but generally we really need to see those in advance. Um, the maths and English at grade C uh, slash four uh, or above um, is really crucial uh, for these programmes. You can't uh, exit any apprenticeship, any apprenticeship uh, without evidencing um, level, level two uh, literacy and numeracy qualifications. So they are absolutely essential. Um, I take the final slide, I think it is. There we go. So uh, I just had my little alarm go off, so I hit my 10 minutes. So I think that is a very quick uh, overview of some of the other side of what's involved in an apprenticeship and uh, happy to take any questions if there are any.
I'll chalk that up as 100% informative. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure who I'm handing back to, sorry. Okay. Thank you, Mark. That was me that you were handing back to. Uh, so thank you so much, Mark, and thank you, Simon and Rachel, for all the presentations. Um, so I'm just going to give everyone an opportunity to pop any questions that you may well have about anything that we have covered in any of the presentations, anything that you think of that you might want a little bit more detail about today, whether that might be the audiology courses, the degree of apprenticeship or the ophthalmic dispensing course. Um, so if there's anything that you feel like you've thought about during the presentation that you might want any more information about, feel free to pop anything into the chat box and I can direct it to the uh, appropriate person. I'll give you a few minutes to maybe have a think if there is anything. I've got them, um, or you should be able to see the email addresses of all the relevant people on the screen there as well. Um, and Mark's was up earlier on. Um, so if you do want to kind of go away and have a think about anything that you've heard about today, um, I know often is the case that sometimes you go away and think, oh, do you know what, I should have probably asked this, or um, I maybe do want a little bit more information or a bit more clarification on something, then our email addresses are also up on the screen as well. So please do feel free to email us about anything that you might want some more information about. The presentations were excellent. So thank you, everybody, again. Um, they were very detailed. So hopefully that does give you an insight in terms of what we can offer yourself if you're a student or if you're an employer, your, your students uh, here at ARU um, and how our courses are structured, how the blended learning courses are designed and delivered to the students. Um, hopefully that was all kind of in great detail and also how our degree apprenticeship works as well. So I think what we'll do then is, if you, as I said, if you do have any questions, then please do feel free to email us. You can also go onto our website as well to get, gain some more information about the courses. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, hopefully you have found it useful. Hopefully you have learnt a little bit more about us at ARU and what we can offer to either yourself if you are a student or if you're an employer to any of your students that you are thinking of maybe helping to develop their careers. Um, and we really do look forward to any questions that you might have. Um, but have a lovely evening and thank you once again for joining. Shabana, there is one question in the chat. Uh, is this recorded or will the slides be shared? The uh, event is recorded. Yes, it will be recorded. Um, so we can send out a recording. Um, so if you do want to forward that on, if there is anybody that you um, were unable to join us today that you think might want the information, that's absolutely fine. We can send the recording. Yes, Karen's just replied, so we will share it via email post the event. So yes, not a problem. Feel free to share it with as many people as you want. So that's absolutely fine. OK, so once again, thank you for joining and hope you all have a lovely evening. Thanks all. See you soon.